We've got breaking news. A senior advisor to the Ayatollah says Iran can produce nuclear bomb today on Secular. Keeping you informed and engaged now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Logan Seculo. We are broadcasting a bit from all over the country today. So my brother is in the Washington, D.C. studio. We're here in the Media Center. Wes Smith is here. We're going to have lots of guests on later today. But the big breaking news that we are covering is out of Iran. And they've said, this is, uh, I'll read it for you directly. This is the advisor said they're capable of building a nuclear bomb. They haven't necessarily decided whether or not they're going to, but they have the ability to. And Jordan, this is a big news for obviously a host of reasons, uh, specifically Coming out of just right now, the Middle East trip that President Biden just made, this is deeply concerning. Yeah, absolutely. This is why he was meeting with our second part of the reason why he's meeting with our allies in the Gulf, not just to beg for more oil uh, for the United States, but also to conti- hopefully continue to build the alliance of countries against Iran and to, to build that alliance. Because, But what we know now is that Iran is at a point which we were all feared – uh, was coming very soon, where they've got all the capabilities they need. All that what they are doing is trying to extort something out from the world. Likely, that's cash and sanctions relief. They also want the Iranian Revolutionary Guard removed from the foreign terrorist organizations list that is uh, held by the, that is put together by the United States. So again, a sanctions issue as well. But I think what they're trying to do clearly by announcing that we've got all the parts. We can ramp up the enrichment. We've got what we need. We've got the ICBMs, the, the missiles capable, both at a short range to target Israel, Saudi Arabia, but also that we've got the, the uh, uh, we can, we've got the ICBMs that can target you in the United States. There could be two issues, though, that arise from this, and we'll talk about it more in the next segment of the broadcast. I want to take your phone calls about it, 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. One is Iran will try to extort, and I think what we saw from the Obama administration, we might see from the Biden administration, which is which is a uh, at least a willingness to consider the Iranian extortion, Logan, which could be uh, the pallets of cash again, yep. so a cash influx, but also sanctions relief. I mean, to me, to put it that Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps even considering taking them off of the foreign terrorist organizations list is just absurd and dangerous. But this puts the world in a very dangerous place. The the nuclear deal, we said from the outset, would put Iran on a path where they would have a nuclear weapon. That deal is expiring in three years, so it's been in existence for seven. The U.S. pulled out of it under the Trump administration. Guess where Iran is? In a position where they are publicly flexing that they have the capability to put together the bomb. But don't worry, yeah. world, we haven't decided whether to do it yet or not. Yeah, here's the quote that came from one of the advisors directly from Kazari. He said, in a few days, we are able to enrich uranium up to 60%, and we can easily produce 90% enriched uranium. Iran has the technical means to produce a nuclear bomb, and there has been no decision yet by Iran to build one. But certainly, discussing it, it's part of the conversation and you know, a bit of a threat. Wes. This is both predictable and it's been predicted. Uh, the IAEA is reporting in connection with this that Iran right now has about 95 pounds of highly enriched uranium. It takes 65 pounds to produce one nuclear weapon. So they already have more than enough uranium and they can actually go to 90 percent and construct a bomb that IAEA is saying in about three weeks if they chose to do it. This is really alarming. Yeah, we're going to keep talking about that as well. Some other topics today. We're going to cover what's going on with the crisis pregnancy centers. We're also going to talk about that fist bump hurled around the world. So we're going to discuss that as well. Some Gallup polls that have come out and people's media confidence. Guess what? Not very high. And a lot more. We're going to discuss that throughout the next hour on Seculo. If you want to be on the air, talk about any of those topics, but specifically Iran over the next few segments, one 800 684 Three one one zero. That's one eight hundred six eight four thirty one ten. We are in the middle of our matching challenge right now in the month of July. So we encourage you right now to go to aclj.org, check out the great content, but also support as all donations are effectively doubled.
One of Iran's top advisers has claimed the country is capable of building a nuclear bomb. The advisor has said the country is currently enriching uranium up to 60 per cent, could easily produce 90 per cent enriched uranium. This is the same Iran, of course, who sides with Russia, supplies terrorist groups around the world, and oh, by the way, wants to assassinate current or former U.S. government officials in retaliation for killing one of their own generals who happened to be a terrorist. President Biden is kind of cautious on saying he will use the military, but here he says that if it's a last resort, he would use it to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. U.S. ally Israel is preparing plans to strike Iranian nuclear facilities as the Jewish state last week reiterated its commitment to stopping Iran from obtaining such a weapon. I clarify to President Biden and his staff that Israel opposes the nuclear agreement and reserves full freedom of action, political and operational, facing the Iranian nuclear program. President Biden also left open the door to military action against Iran as a last resort. There's a proposal on the negotiating table. I hope that Iran will look at that and will come come back to the table and reach an agreement with us. Israel is surrounded by countries who either currently or previously have denied their very existence. Some of Israel's neighbors have promised to wipe Israel off the map. I am quite certain the United States would never allow an unfriendly neighbor to have nuclear weapons. Israel thinks the same way about Iran. Both countries will work together, and I want to quote this correctly, by using all elements of their national power, unquote, to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. It's in everybody's interest to work together to try and ensure that they do not acquire a nuclear weapon. That's been the policy of Republican and Democratic administrations. Welcome back to Secular. We are taking some of your phone calls at 1-800-684-3110. So call us now and those on hold will get you in a minute. But I think we need to reset, Jordan, for those people who are just joining us now because, you know, people obviously on, on restaurant radio are just getting in their cars. They're hearing what's happening. And maybe they clicked on a push notification they got from one of the social media platforms and saw the big news that Iran says they are capable of building a nuclear bomb. And why is that important to us? I think why it's important, obviously, to the Middle East and Israel in general. It's something we need to break down a little bit this is one of the advisors who said in a few days we were able to enrich uranium up to 60 percent and we can easily produce 90 percent enriched uranium iran has the technical means to produce a nuclear bomb but there's been no decision by iran to build one so west smith is here in the studio but jordan maybe give people a bit of a breakdown then we'll hear what west has to say sure so what we now know is that iran which they're publicly stating which uh, again, I would, uh, you don't always have to believe the Iranians or believe these uh, dictatorial regimes, but we know that they have been on a path towards uh, getting the materials necessary to put together a nuclear weapon. And they are now saying that they have that right after the president of the United States leaves the region, meeting with one of their top enemies, the Saudis, and of course the Israelis. And there's two issues at play here. One, uh, they're saying that they've got the uranium at the level they need it. Uh, to create the weaponry. We also know that they've got the deliverable capabilities uh, that Iran at least has claimed to have, not just, remember, for Israel's sake and for the region, they don't need ICBMs. They don't need intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, to deliver. They just need uh, short-range missiles, and you can deliver, again, these uh, devastating weapons. Remember, this is in the hands of a regime that believes that you've got to uh, act in a way to somehow bring back the 12th, in Imam, I just want to remind people about their religion that they rely on and the extreme version of their religion. And they believe that you do that, that the 12th Imam, the hidden Imam, returns uh, yeah, or, you know, is no longer hidden if you do something dramatic like a nuclear attack on Israel or the great Satan, a nuclear attack on the United States. These are not rational actors. This is not India and Pakistan with nuclear weapons pointing at each other. It's not a Cold War uh, situation. Uh, you have to treat them much differently. Look at the terror that they've exported around the world. Look at what they're willing to do and engage in around the world. So we now know they're at this point. So so what, where do we go next? I think what we have to look for in this administration is Iran is trying to blackmail. They are trying to extort money and sanctions relief. Right now, they're going to play, they're playing with the idea of we have this, but we haven't built it yet. So, what will you give us 
in return for not building it. And of course, you did have to trust them that there's some that they're actually not building it. Remember, we don't have access. The IAE has never had access to most of their facilities where this would be built. But again, I think we're at an unfortunate point. I want to play this sound too, Logan. I think this is important between Israel's interim prime minister Yair Lapid and President Biden because there was a direct disagreement on how to deal with Iran. And this was before that news. Take a listen. I continue to believe that diplomacy is the best way to achieve this outcome. Words will not stop them, Mr. President. Diplomacy will not stop them. If they continue to develop their nuclear program, the free world will use force. So I think that's another part, Logan, that has to be important, is that the the rest of that region, and I would put Israel in line with the rest of the Gulf states, and I'll go to West on this, but I, I they do not want Iran to put together this weapon. And what you heard from Yair Lapid, who's the interim prime minister, is we will go to war before that happens. So are we on the cusp of yet another conflict in the world, another major world conflict? We already have one going on in Europe. Are we about to see one in the Middle East? Yeah, and, you know, the, there are bipartisan members of Congress that have warned President Biden about continued negotiations and the possibility of lifting sanctions on Iran. As you said, Jordan, the uh, Israel and the Arab Gulf states are totally against what's going on there, including Prime Minister Lapid. And we know that in 2015, the last time we you know, relieved Iran from sanctions, they got about $100 billion when we did that under President Obama. They used that money to deliver over 10000 rockets and missiles to Hezbollah and Hamas. And in addition to that, they armed up the Houthi rebels in Yemen. And the Houthi rebels, because of that Iran deal in 2015, were allowed to overthrow the government in Yemen. And so they will use the money for that and for continued work on their nuclear weapons program. And yet, and yet, and this was a surprise to me, and I follow this pretty closely, President Biden in Israel said that they had actually delivered their final offer to the Iranian government that essentially was on their desk and that if they signed it, they would go forward with the agreement. And yet in that agreement there, it allows Iran to have access again to billions and billions of dollars with no restraints on their ballistic missile system. Uh, this is, this is bad diplomacy. It's bad for the world. You know, it's bad for the United States of America. And yet he is insisting I'm going forward with this. The only thing that's holding us back right now is Iran has not signed it. Tim is calling in California. On line two, Tim, welcome. You're on the air. Thank you for taking my call. Why is the Biden administration blinded to the fact that Iran has the technology to destroy the world? Jordan, do you think that this is blindness or you think this is just uh, what happens when you have uh, this administration in office? It's a weak, weak leadership. Uh, they, the Iran wants something from the Biden administration. I don't think they want a war yet. I don't think they want to launch a nuclear weapon yet. I think they want to see what they can get. And wh- what does that mean? Well, that means economic relief, sanctions relief, the removal of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, which is unbelievable to even say, but we know that this administration is, has considered it at certain points. Uh, is uh, from the foreign terrorist organizations list. I think they are trying to blackmail, which is typical of Iran, or trying to extort uh, fr- something from the world by putting this information out. Now, the question is this. The U.S. right now may not be posed to strike, but there are other countries, not just Israel, who are going to be very uncomfortable after this statement is out now by a top advisor to the Ayatollah the supreme leader of Iran, who put his name out. This isn't an unnamed person. Uh, so put his name out with it. And who are who are not going to be so patient with Iran. And I think, unfortunately, we could be on the cusp of another conflict. And a major conflict. Because take out their nuclear capability. They have massive weapons capabilities, a large military. And this is a, a region which, again... Uh, there's a lot of unity against Iran, but that unity has not been tested in military action before. Yeah, Let's keep going and take some more calls. Uh, we have another call coming in. Ronald from South Carolina on line one. Ronald, you're on the air. And, hey, if you want to be on the air, too, 1-800-684-3110. We're going to move on from this topic after this segment. But we may, if you have a question or comment about it, we'll be happy to take it. Ronald's calling in South Carolina. You're on the air. 
Thank you very much for taking my call. Uh, one of the questions, as Jordan had put it so eloquently, is the fact that they're irrational, and yet this Biden administration consistently wants to make deals with someone that's completely irrational. And what I think uh, the whole trip to the Middle East was more or less, I think they already knew that they goofed because I think he was going there to try and convince the Middle East that, hey, it's not our fault that Iran is this far along. We try to do what we can, but nothing that they do is anything positive for what the Middle East is going through right now. Yeah, Jordan. Well, listen, I, I think that we, we've been put on a path by the Obama administration that was not good because we dealt with Iran. We gave them the deal that allowed them to get to the point they're at now. Believe them or not, we know that their nuclear program has advanced significantly in those uh, seven years. And so, since the deal. And we know that the deal has only got a few years left. We know that the, the Biden team would like to still sign that deal. This is, I think, where we have to watch very closely in the next few days. Are we about to hand over pallets of cash and sanctions relief to a radical terrorist regime that is threatening not just Israel, not just the Gulf states or the Sunni states, but it's threatening the United States directly. Yeah, well, so and see, we cannot see Iran with a nuclear weapon. And I think that Israel has pledged, you know, never again will our people be able to be annihilated. They will go in. If this tr statement is that true and they're they able to get the intel that this is correct, there will be conflict. Uh, this will not be handled with sanctions relief. It does feel like, Wes, we treat Iran differently. And it's always the topic points, always sort of, and we only got a minute left. But this becomes an issue every time. It became an issue with the, with the Obama administration. Then obviously the Trump administration came in, undid some things. And now it's back. Iran always is the talking point, And they're always making these threats. But we treat it like they don't. Yeah, exactly. Under the last two Republican presidents, sanctions had so crippled the Iranian economy, it had slowed down their research and development of nuclear weapons. But because of the deal in 2015 with President Obama and then Biden you know, coming in now, giving them hope, allowing things to happen. We're at the point, uh, Logan, where probably, and this is most unfortunate, the only thing that's going to stop them from acquiring a nuclear weapon is some sort of military action. Hopefully, if Israel carries it out, the United States military will enable them with refueling and targeting and other things. Uh, but I'd, I'm not hopeful that we can stop them any other way. Yeah, hey, we're going to be taking calls coming up, 1-800-684-3110. We're also going to be talking about the attacks currently happening on crisis pregnancy centers around the country. We're going to discuss that with Cece Heil, who will be joining us in studio. Coming up, again, we are in the middle of our matching challenge at ACLJ, which means all donations are effectively doubled. Another donor is there waiting to donate alongside of you. If you give $10, they're ready to match that and make it 20 So that's at ACLJ.org. Be right back. After nearly 50 years, Roe versus Wade, the tragic ruling that manufactured a so-called right to abortion has been overturned by the United States Supreme Court. This is the moment the ACLJ has been fighting for. It's the biggest victory we've achieved in our three decade long fight against the soulless abortion industry. And believe me, abortionists like Planned Parenthood are devastated. This victory would not have been possible without the steadfast prayer and support of ACLJ members like you. On behalf of the entire ACLJ, I thank you for standing with us against the abortion industry and helping us save defenseless babies. This is a monumental win, but the war is far from over. The left is already scrambling to make abortion permanent in many states across the country. In California, for example, a bill just passed through another committee to allow for abortion up to 28 days after birth. It's truly the most evil bill we've ever seen. Extreme abortion advocates are not just going to give up, and neither are we. On behalf of the countless innocent souls that Roe vs. Wade has taken over the last 50 years. Those of us that believe in life know that we're on the right side of history. We understand full well, children are children, and they're precious in God's sight, and they're precious in our nation's sight, and they're precious to parents. That unborn child has human rights, human dignity, human worth, a life that deserves protection. I thank you for making this victory possible, and I ask you for your continued prayer and support as we continue to battle against barbaric new abortion laws across our nation. We now have a state-by-state -state fight 
your support of the ACLJ makes a huge difference. Any amount you donate to the ACLJ this month, we get a matching gift, which means, as we've said before, if you donate $20, we get $40. You donate $100, we get $200. We encourage you to do it. Welcome back to the Seculo. Cece Hiles joining us in studio right now. She's a brand new blog that's available on ACLJ.org. You need to check out. It's right on the homepage. It is Biden's new executive order aims to protect abortion while attacking pro-life pregnancy centers. What's new? And that is the title of the blog. Again, it's available on ACLJ.org. It seems like the pro-life pregnancy centers always end up being oddly in the crosshairs for these kind of situations when really they're out there doing amazing work. Uh, whether you are pro-life or not, they're doing some amazing work and providing uh, a lot of, they provide a lot of the services Planned Parenthood, you know, pretends they, they offer. Right, exactly. And and like I, I say in the blog, the executive order's goal was to expand access to abortion care and medication abortions. But, you know, no pro-abortion action is ever going to be um, complete unless they include an attack against uh, these pro-life centers. Yep. And so right in the executive order in Section 4B4, um, it says in the executive order, the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall, in consultation with the Attorney General and the Chair of the FTC, consider options to address deceptive or fraudulent practices related to reproductive health care services, including online, and to protect access to accurate information. And we see that this is the language that they use over and over again. We've defended um, pregnancy resource centers, also crisis pregnancy centers, also known as CPCs. Uh, we've defended them for decades, and this is exactly the language that they use to go after them. We've seen that even in New York, New York trying to go after and investigate whether pregnancy resource centers limit access to abortion. They use this exact same language. So every time you see a pro-abortion push, you're going to see an attack against uh, pregnancy resource centers. Yeah, that exist all over the country. Jordan, I know you've done a lot of work with them. Yeah, and I think what you have to understand here is remember for uh, the left and for the Biden administration, when they use language uh, like mis you know the misinformation or fraudulent information, what they don't like about the pregnancy centers is that they are pro-life. So they're going to take a pro-life position, which means, guess what? They're not going to try and, and, and tell a, 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 a woman who is pregnant the, the great virtues of having an abortion. They're not going to. They're not going to go and say. In fact, they're going to talk about the negatives. It's called freedom of speech. There's no Roe versus Wade. This is an executive order without teeth. Now the states are where the issues are, but you see how they are setting up this debate that these pro-life pregnancy centers are putting out fraudulent information. And Logan, what they mean by that? So for our audience to understand is, being pro-life means you're being fraudulent. Saying that there are that that women struggle post-abortion uh, with, uh, with, with issues. And these are experts in the field, whether you, like you said, whether you're pro-life or not, they've been working in this field for decades. We get those calls all the time on our broadcast about people who had abortions in the 60s and you know, the 70s and 80s who are still dealing with that today uh, and, and that decision they made today, a decision they made when they were a young woman. And so, yeah, they talk about those things. At, at the pro-life pregnancy centers, and they don't shy away from from that the truth, but that is what they're. That's why Elizabeth Warren says they've got to be shut down. That you've got to that they're somehow torturing women by not providing abortion. This is what we saw in California when they said if you want to continue operating, you've got to also advertise for the local abortion clinic. Yeah, and there are things like even Google. I know you put in your blog that is kind of making adjustments to their algorithms to make sure. If you search for one thing, you're not getting the other, and uh, you know you're not getting a, a crisis pregnancy center or a pro-life pregnancy center. Right. So the, in uh, the con there are congressmen and attorney attorneys general that have gone after Google, written a letter to Google, basically saying when someone searches for abortion, you can't have these, you know, fake clinics again uh, show up instead of an abortion clinic. And so they're they're so concerned just as Jordan rightfully said, of a client, of a pregnant woman going to a pregnancy resource center and getting the accurate information about the life inside of her and what her options are when she gets those in, that information and obviously when she sees her baby on an ultrasound, it's overwhelming. The majority of women choose to, to keep their baby. So that is why crisis pregnancy centers, pregnancy resource centers, they are at the center of attack always for the pro-abortion group. 
Yeah, it's a bizarre thing. I think that you know, they again, Jordan. We we've talked about this many times, and, and in his blog, by the way, check out the blog. You can read in detail all the stuff CC is saying on ACLJ.org. Right now, if you do it during our broadcast, it's on the right hand side of the page. But if you look later on, it's one of our. I think it's our most popular article right now, and it's called Biden's New Executive Order. Um, yes, uh, aims to protect abortion while attacking pro life pregnancy centers. What's new? And you can find that there. Make sure you share that as well as reading it. Um, it's a really good read. It gives you a lot of a lot of detail about what exactly is going on. And with that, I wanted to also talk about the work of the ACLJ because people were in the middle of our, our fundraising push, which is our matching challenge, which is every donation that is made, there's someone on the other side ready to match that donation. And there's incredible content. You know, we do incredible work in court. And we talk about that all the time. CC Jordan, both uh, legal experts, both lawyers. We talk about that all the time, but you also have to, you know, just imagine. I always like to say, look beyond the glass here. Look beyond on your, your, your wherever you're watching or you're listening to this, and imagine the hundreds of people that are currently working on this incredible content, whether it's our video content, whether it's our daily radio broadcast. Uh, you know, we try to hire the best of the best to make sure you get the highest level of production possible, and we get the highest level of work. And we cannot do that without you. And that's, uh, you can support the work right now during our matching challenge at ACLJ. Dot org. But Jordan, this is nothing new for us. We've been a part of this fight for you know, 30, 40 years at this point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm with our team in Washington, D.C. Uh, we launched ACLJ Action, a C4 to even counter in a post row world what this would be. We know that there's always been this animosity, and they tried to use the political, legal, uh, and, and um, legislative, usually at the state and local level. We see it in New York City, we see it in California. But now they've got a president pushing it at the federal level. They've got U.S. senators like Elizabeth Warren pushing it at a federal level to criminalize pro-life pregnancy centers. Now, this is at a time when they just lost the biggest abortion case in history. They lost that protection that somehow abortion gets treated, the abortion distortion. So their first effort is to take out the pro-life pregnancy centers. Now, talk, think about how we talk about them. We're not hiding what they are. We're calling them pro-life pregnancy centers. They are there to protect the life of the unborn. These are adult. Uh, these are women who can make decisions about where they want to go. And in most states, as of right now, uh, abortion is still legal. Uh, it's not everywhere, but in most. And so these decisions, again. Uh, the fact is, they show you an ultrasound, they tell you the truth, and they get to have their freedom of speech. And this is a, but they want to shut these groups down because they are the front line. They are the answer to the question, Logan, of what are you going to do with all these children? And yeah. what the abortion industry doesn't want everybody to know is we already have that answer. Yeah, We've I think been doing that for decades. That there is, is a, no rush about that because we already have these institutions in place. Now, if they shut them down... Then you create a void because they are the conduits to adoption. They are the conduits to helping uh, maybe someone who is in need economically or whose family's not helping them to, to provide them the resources they need. We've been on the front lines with them. We'll continue to be on the front lines with them. Support the work of the ACLJ because this war is just starting. We told you, take some time to celebrate the win overturning Roe versus Wade. But the war is ongoing as we speak. We're about to start our first advertising campaign, Logan, through ACLJ Action next week on a state constitutional amendment. We'll get into more. Support our work. ACLJ.org. Donate today. Double the impact of your donation. Be part of our matching challenge so we can not only continue to do the work that we do, but we can continue to expand the work that we do as well at the ACLJ. That's ACLJ.org. Donate today if you can. We'll be right back. Second half hour coming up. In my time in service, both as CI director and as secretary of state, I watched the good work that the ACLJ was doing here in the States and all across the world. The ACLJ's work at the UN overseas is incredibly important. We have on our team policy experts. They're all engaged in foreign policy issues. We actually try to go in and do something positive and actually affect change. We had a series of cases primarily dealing with religious liberty. Nations that had more religious freedom had better democracies. We've taken the First Amendment and that has been our cornerstone. It's to defend the rights of people of faith. We not only hold our government accountable, 
but we hold other governments accountable. You have to actually be committed to fighting it out, or else you'll never win. We're in a matching challenge campaign. Any amount you donate, we get a matching gift for. Go to ACLJ.org today. That's ACLJ.org. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Seculo. And now your host, Logan Seculo. Welcome back to Seculo. We're going to be taking your calls at 1 800 684 3110. Just to reset the show a bit, we're going to be talking a lot in the second half hour. We'll also be joined by Rick Grinnell later on. One of the things we're going to be discussing is the media confidence ratings. I know we're coming out of just having a discussion about pro life pregnancy centers. Some people are calling about that. We'll take those calls. Some people are calling about Iran and, and you know, the nuclear bomb announcement. We're going to be talking about that as well. So if you want to discuss any of those topics, we'll do our best to get to them at 1-800-684-3110. And we'd love to hear from you. I think this is a great time. It's a great time of the year also to hear where you're at as an ACLJ supporter, as a secular listener. I'd love to hear where you guys are on this issue. We also have President Biden obviously going overseas, having his whole trip and the fist bump heard around the world. A lot of people have some issues with that. You know, it's kind of the bowing of 2022. If you don't remember, that's what happened when uh, you know, President Obama was on his apology tour throughout the Middle East. Uh, and now you have this fist bump moment that a lot of people are discussing, Will, uh, just to kind of show the lack of seriousness that some of this is being take, or uh, essentially that we're, we're bowing down to people because of, of these situations. That's right. There is even analysis by CNN's Chris Saliza about the fist bump and he says why joe biden's fist bump with mbs was such a disaster now the entire trip president biden said he wasn't going to be shaking hands because of the resurgence of some variants of covid but when he got to saudi arabia he got out of the beast out of the presidential limousine and walked up and uh mbs walked out of the palace and they immediately fist bumped and the optics, and that's something consistently that the president's administration, this Biden administration gets wrong, are the optics. And that because there was no handshake and and because there was this fist bump, it almost made them look like buddies. Uh, yeah. Like, hey, bro, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Do the fist bump. When he was saying he was going over there to be serious, he was going to talk about the human rights issues. Yeah. He was going to do all these things. But the first image you see is uh, Mohammed bin Salman walking out, the crown prince, and boom, fist bump. And so that's why some are calling it the fist bump heard around the world, because it completely undercut the message that he's going to the pariah nation, who he called that, and that now all of a sudden he's best buddies. Yeah, and I think that, look, I don't want to be hypocritical. I think having these conversations, having these meetings is important. I think they should be meeting. I thought it was important when President Trump met with Kim Jong-un. I think that these are uh, you know, these are big Issues happen, not even to compare the two, by the way. I mean, that's massively different because right. uh, Saudi Arabia and what's going on in North Korea. I don't want to compare those two. But it is a conversation to have of how we're looking on a global stage. And I think this is a big problem with this presidency. It's not just uh, who he's meeting with, how he's meeting with them. It's how things are presented, what kind of unforced errors are happening continually. And this is just sort of that that trajectory. Of feeling like chaos. It's why you see the percentage of support for Joe Biden, even amongst Democrats, to be so low they don't even want him to run again in just two years. When this, oh, look, we're, we're close. I know it sounds crazy. It feels like we used to live pre, maybe pre social media, live in a world where uh, election cycles ended. It doesn't feel like that anymore, does it? It feels like you have uh, a year or two in between each election. Doesn't feel like you have four years because now we have midterms and then they announce quickly. And look, we're probably a good. You know, we're not very far away from people really starting. You already can tell who is going to be running for president on both the Republicans and the Democrats. That's right. Maybe you've seen Gavin Newsom running ads in the state of Florida. Maybe you've seen that already start to happen. Why? Because these are the likely candidates that will be running for president. So I don't want to ignore this and pretend it's not happening. And we have some interesting, interesting feedback amongst uh, Gallup put out a new poll about the media confidence rec uh, ratings. And guess what? It's at a record low. We'll discuss those numbers. I know it's shocks to all, shocking to all of you. I'm sure you're listening right now and going, I can't believe people don't trust the media. Give us a call. I want to hear your thoughts on the media right now. Maybe the far right, the far left. Let's hear your thoughts on all the media. 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. Again, Rick Grinnell will be joining us towards the end of the show as well. Live from Israel. So we'll be discussing a lot 
talking with him on how his trip is going and all the things that they're doing there. Support the work of the ACLJ, part of a matching challenge right now. ACLJ.org. All donations are effectively doubled, matched by another donor. So we appreciate your support, specifically right now in the month of July. Be right back. Because of the support of every member of the ACLJ, one of the practice areas that we've been able to develop is Freedom of Information Act requests or FOIA requests. It's thousands of pages of paper, and in those thousands of pages of paper, you usually find a nugget. The goal here is to gather the puzzle pieces. Sometimes you don't know which ones will be important until they become important. Government agencies acting out of control. We have exposed that yep. in our FOIA litigation, and we do that every day that we bring these cases. It is your statutory right as an American citizen to have access to documents that reveal uh, how the government is functioning, how your government is functioning. Do you remember the Iraq? deal. There was a video about what took place on that deal and it was edited. The edit took out the key part of what was going on. State Department, White House, editing videos to keep it from the American public. We know because our FOIA litigation got that document. We took it to the IRS. No one ever does that. And what the IRS was doing was violating the Constitution and statutory law. Because of the litigation we engaged in, they can't do what they were doing before. They've been hiding behind in the shadows. We, these FOIAs bring them to light. All of this information came because we went to court yeah. to get the information. Many times when we make these requests, the, uh, the requests actually end up in court as the bureaucracy fights back to withhold the information. But that's okay because the law is on our side. We are entitled to the information uh, that is in the, these requests that we have made. We've got the declassified list of Obama administration officials who started asking to unmask. We have caught them now. They have no one in there to protect them anymore. They were used to the bureaucracy protecting them. Those of you that support the ACLJ, this is what it's all about at the end of the day. Support the work of the ACLJ with our matching challenge. Go to aclj.org. It's all because of you. And you can double the impact your donation today at aclj.org. Go online and donate now. Welcome back to Secula. We are discussing... Fun news. It's coming out of Gallup, you know, research center. Do a lot of polling. Maybe you've gotten their calls before. They have a new poll out, Will, and it's uh, discussing the media confidence rating. And guess what? It's at a record low. That's right. Let's go through the numbers here. Just 16%. I like the way they spin this because it sounds like nice. 16% of Americans have a great deal, quite a lot of confidence in newspapers and 11% have the same degree in confidence in television news. Democrat confidence is low, but higher than even Republicans and independents. So what they're saying is even, <laughs> I do love that they just presume that Democrats have much more trust in the media. It's almost showing the bias there alone. Right. But even amongst Democrats, it's significantly low. And you're talking about 11 to 16% of people that have really any trust in the mainstream news. And, that is honestly such a disturbing number. I know it's not a shocking number, but it really is a disturbing number for where we are as a society, where if you flip on the news, whether you're a conservative, whether you're a liberal, you don't feel like you are getting uh, the facts, doesn't feel like you're getting uh, the truth. And, you know, I even saw uh, an ad this week for Shepard Smith has a new show, and it's like the whole concept of the show is you will not hear our opinion. But that opinion or that news is coming well, from Dan Abrams is even doing it. He's yeah. starting a whole news network trying to do similar where the yeah, news isn't... nation. Yeah. News nation exists. But it's, there's still opinion journalism sure. in there. Look, Dan Abrams, uh, he's, he's got some good stuff. His his uh, whatever version of live PD is coming back in the next couple of weeks. I look forward to that. It comes out at the end of this week. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, the problem is, is you have Shepard Smith, who historically was fairly biased. Now saying, trust me, I'm not going to give you my opinion. And I think we all look at that and go, this is sad where we're at. It's sad that we don't only, not only do we not trust the media, but we are getting fed the idea of you can listen to us and hear the straight news from people who are historically not the most uh, you know, straight and narrow when it comes to giving you just the news. Right. And in this poll, it also found they did a ranking of, of uh, 16 other major institutions so not just media they did you know uh businesses the military criminal justice system etc and 
Television news and newspapers ranked nearly at the bottom of the list of institutions. The only institution that got less confidence from the American public was Congress. So that kind of tells you where we're at when it comes to how people see the brokenness of Congress, the, the, really that they're not looking out for their constituents in many ways. They're just putting the party above all else, but also that the media is kind of locked in right there with it, that the, uh, the seven percent confidence rating in Congress in general, not specific Congress people, uh, to the 11 percent for television news is really telling about where people are right now. Yeah, I wonder where, I mean, does it say in here kind of where people were beforehand? Like, is this right. new? Is this new that the, the, the support is so low? It's a 5 percent drop from last year. Oh, just, so, yeah, just last year. So the media, we obviously know media took a big hit. in the 90s, through, did we feel that way? Like, through the, the pandemic, but within a 5% drop in confidence in television news in just one year is a very significant mm -hmm. dip. That's not within even a margin no. of error, typically, when you do a poll like there that. There is a number in here that says confidence in television news has never been higher than in 1993, which around, you got to think about that's around the start of CNN. Right, 24-hour you know, news 24 cycle. 24-hour news kind of just becoming a thing. And at that point, it was at 46% of people were, were confident in it. Uh, and then obviously there was other numbers that came out and it's just been slipping ever so much as, as, as things have gotten more partisan well, and, and, and as you, there's more options too. Whenever you have a general poll like this, I feel like it's always going to be hard to get a positive over 50% rating because it's not, what is your confidence in the Washington Post or uh, the Wall Street Journal or Fox News? It is what is your confidence in newspaper media? So because, like you yeah. said, there are options, it's always going to kind of skew probably a little bit more negative when you think of a general institution. But the fact that it is so low. I think in the last couple of it's years, pretty big. it's also that a lot of the mainstream news stories that weren't even being allowed to share because at the time were called fake or were called false information or partially false or misleading and all of a sudden, a year later, two years later, you have mainstream news outlets sharing the same news that we all knew all along. Things that would get you banned from social media platforms yeah. and, and red flags against your posts mm -hmm. and things of that nature are now able to be reported because the trusted institutions such are as now newspapers. Doing it. Right. Yeah. And stuff that we knew all along. And I think that, that is a, a big problem. Sure, we want to make sure that there are people who are checking the facts, making sure that some of these news sources are sourced well and all of that. Look, I've worked with some of them. Some are incredibly well sourced. And they are working a lot to make sure they are giving you confident information. Doesn't mean it doesn't come without a bias, but at least information from their point of view. And it's backed up. The problem is you had a lot of distrust in the news when people, individuals, were being taken off of social media because of really their point of view. Not only their point of view, just because they get their news from a different outlet than, say, Facebook does. Or, say, Twitter does. Or... Instagram, that you got your news from maybe an alternative source, and therefore it made it invalid, and then, oh, look what happened, a couple of years pass, a year passes, and all of a sudden we're allowed to discuss this. All of a sudden you're allowed to discuss uh, the creation of COVID. All of a sudden you're allowed to discuss the Hunter Biden laptop. All of a sudden you're allowed to discuss uh, side effects that happen uh, from even from the vaccine, something that, uh, you know, again, we were very pro vaccine on this show, but there was stuff you had to make sure you said and could not say or they would bounce you immediately. It's pretty wild. Uh, and to see that change in the news media, even this weekend, go look at what was reported this weekend and stuff like the New York Times, stuff that you would have been removed from the Internet, essentially sh not only shadow banned, like locked out. But you're allowed to say it now because now a trusted institution can say it. And I think that is where people start losing extreme trust in the whole concept of uh, mainstream news. Do you think, you know, you, you brought up the Shepard Smith example. Do you think that people in the more mainstream media are getting the wrong idea? Because I don't see people wanting no opinion in their news. I think they want people to be honest about their yeah. opinion in the news. I think that that's why you see the, the what you maybe refer to as an alternative source, but maybe conservative media that isn't a television network that gets, uh, whether it be blogs or shows like this, where people come to for their news because they want to hear the analysis of the news. Sure, you can you can give the bullet point of the facts, such as the the Iranians today saying, 
you know, we have the capability to build a nuclear bomb. They don't just want necessarily a Associated Press-style bullet point. What they want to hear is someone with military expertise, expertise. with analysis of that, that, yeah, there's an opinion to sure. this. I think the rise of someone like a Tulsi Gabbard is the proof of that, which is someone that a lot of conservatives, look, if you, I, I'm, I have a huge amount of respect for her. We've worked with her directly, and uh, I had her on my special, uh, Revenge of the Taliban, which you can watch about the Afghanistan, uh, the botched Afghanistan removal. Um, I have a huge amount of respect for her. Obviously, she has a military background and uh, served our country in many different ways. Now, am I going to line up with 100% of her opinions on some of her political leanings? I mean, she ran against President Trump as a Democrat. Uh, obviously, things have shifted a little maybe since then for her politically, so I can give her a little bit of respect for that. But I do look at that and go, why do people like listening to her? Why is she? can she go on the conservative talk shows? Why can she go speak at CPAC? Uh, because at least people believe that she believes what she's saying. People just want people who actually believe what they're saying. It doesn't even matter if you agree with them, but at least you know that they believe it, that they're not just giving you a political point of view that is, is locked to a party or anything like that, and people respect that. And I think that is proof in her rise and people like Russell Brand uh, on, on social media, beginning people who are not, even Joe Rogan, not exactly the highest uh, Republican conservatives, but people who at least are not only speaking their mind, are giving you an intelligent, backed-up version of why they feel that way. And you can agree or disagree, but you can respect it. That's what we need in, in media right now. We need at least people that you see on TV and you read in the newspaper, you can at least respect they are giving you their point of view. Even if at least they're telling the truth to themselves. And I don't think you have that everywhere. Hey, in the next segment, we're going to have Rick Grinnell joining us, right? That's right. And he's live in Israel, so we're going to discuss what's going on over there in the Middle East. And, and a whole lot more. We do a few calls. Uh, I, we'll do our best to get to you in the next segments. Uh, and we'll see what we can do about that. And we, I almost went to you. We only have one minute left. But let's check in on them, make sure they're doing okay. Uh, give us a call if you want to be on the air, 1-800-684-3110. But right now, I need you to support the work of the ACLJ. And uh, I'm sure Rick will tell you that you need to as well. We'll be discussing that with him. It's all the incredible work we're doing all over the world. You know, you, you, Again, you see this sort of small lens of here's our studio. But the things that are going on outside these walls, physically right here in the studio, and what's going on in our media center, what's going on in Washington, D.C., where my brother is right now, what's going on in our offices across the planet. And we cannot do any of that work without your support. And I appreciate it. Go to aclj.org, make your donation. But while you're there, I always encourage this one, download the ACLJ app. It makes it easy. See all the incredible content. We've got that new blog from CC and new blogs that go up each and every day. New video content on our YouTube and Rumble channels. Take a look at all the incredible content we're producing for the ACLJ for you. I think you'll really enjoy it. Coming up in the next segment, Rick Grinnell. We'll be right back with more on Secular. Senator Joe Manchin, of course, abruptly pulled the plug this week on the Democrats. No, Martha, he didn't abruptly. Pass. Martha, oh, oh, Martha, okay, let, 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 okay. he abruptly on Friday. He didn't did abruptly that. do anything. He was he negotiating has sabotaged for a while. the president's agenda. No. Uh, look, if you check the record six months ago, I made it clear that you have people like Manchin, Cinema, Cinema to a lesser degree, who are intentionally sabotaging the president's agenda, what the American people want, what a majority of us in the Democratic caucus want. After he pulled out of Build Back Better in December and said he was done, you went from these, this kind of minute-to-minute -minute incremental coverage of the, the ins and outs to basically a blackout uh, as the negotiations took place directly between you know, Schumer and Manchin and the White House and Manchin hoping that they could piece back together something that Manchin kept laying out. You put more government money into energy, energy prices uh, can, can come down. And he was going to pay for a lot of that by another deflationary measure, which was going to uh, allow Medicare to negotiate for prescription drug prices. Manchin was lying. Like, I don't think he was ever okay with this. Joe Manchin is representing his state. He's representing West Virginia. They do not want to see more taxes. They don't want to see a climate tax. They want to make certain 
that they keep the tax cuts from the Trump era. Right. Bernie doesn't want that. Bernie wants the government, the federal government, to have control of your life 24-7, 365. Manchin is taking arrows for other members of the Senate that might not have vocalized how difficult this vote would be for them, um, but it ultimately would be more difficult for them than they've uh, admitted or conceded in negotiations. They know Bernie Sanders is for big government and taking away those individual freedoms. Welcome back to Segulo. Last segment of the day. We are joined live from Israel by Rick Grinnell. Rick, uh, first, why don't you give our listeners a bit of an update of why you're there and what's going on? Well, I am uh, part of the delegation for CPAC Israel. It's very exciting. We'll be spending a couple of days here. Uh, I'm at the King David Hotel, so I'm sure you know exactly where I am. And <laughs> uh, the sun has set, and it's a beautiful, beautiful night in Jerusalem. Awesome. That's so great to hear. Uh, you know, we have, I've been back to Israel in a few years, but yeah, I know, know exactly where you are. You're kind of there in an interesting time when President Biden, uh, you know, he ends his trip to the Middle East coming up. And uh, we talked about earlier in this show, you had a senior advisor to the Ayatollah in Iran saying, you know, we have the ability to, to build a nuclear bomb. Uh, do you think, though, based on what you've seen, and obviously we've talked about, you know, the fist bump, we've talked about all the issues that have happened in this trip. Uh, do you think that's a de- direct response to sort of the, the weakness that we're seeing from this administration in the Middle East? Yeah, look, you know, we're here for a little bit of Republican response, I guess, here in uh, Israel. And it's clear that the trip was not good for President Biden. Uh, He made fundamental mistakes the whole time. He is not well received in the region. Certainly the Saudis remember that he wanted them to be a pariah state. Uh, His administration has worked really hard to uh, really ruin relations with with Saudi Arabia. And then, you know, basically he showed up with uh, gas cans begging for uh, some help. And I think he needs to be a little bit more strategic. If you're going to somehow make Saudi Arabia pariah state, you can't expect to come back and get favors. And I think whether it's the Emiratis or the Saudis, they're all now correcting the record. Uh, they started correcting the record pretty fast once Joe Biden got in the air. And so uh, I would just say to the White House, uh, you've got to be much more strategic about your language and what you're trying to do. Certainly, we know the Iran deal is uh, in trouble. And what is the Biden administration's response going to be now that uh, their premier uh, focus for an Iran deal is falling apart. Well, and and as the Iranians now are are kind of uh, promoting this, they they hadn't in the past been open saying that they had the technological capability of building a nuclear bomb and and things. But we see this out of the uh, the senior advisor to the Ayatollah. Now they're strategically, I would feel like releasing this information, saying you know we haven't decided if we're going to build a bomb, but we do have the technical capability. Do you think that uh, we we always thought that Iran had much more capability than they were being uh, open about? But do you think that now this pivot uh, is a new challenge that we see when facing the Iranians, especially as the Biden administration still tries to push for a uh, diplomatic response? You know, I've been working on this issue with Iran since 2001, since I started at the United Nations. And I I have to say the one thing I've learned over 20 plus years of working on this issue is we can always count on the Iranians to completely mess up uh, the situation. And so we have, um, you know, a frustration in the U.S. with Iran. I think the Europeans are frustrated with Iran. But for the Iranian regime now to come out and say that they're close to a nuclear weapon um, or they're going to get one, is really remarkable because uh, it, it's exactly what we thought all along. We know from the very beginning that the Iranians have lied about the number of centrifuges and the weaponization, and that we've known that they've lied about the heavy water 
uh, amount that they have accumulated. So there's all sorts of evidence showing that we cannot trust the Iranians. I'm not sure why the Biden administration has decided to trust them and, and start a negotiation again, but it seems to be the pattern that the uh, Biden administration keeps trusting what these uh, people say, and yet we have so much evidence that they, they've lied from the beginning. I'm actually pleased that they're coming out and now confronting what the Biden team has said, uh, that they, they weren't close, they weren't uh, right there at the, the limits, and now the Iranians are admitting that they are. Yep. And so uh, we're being saved by the Iranians here. Interesting, interesting perspective on that. Let's take a phone call. I think a lot of people have a lot of these issues. Nick in D.C. Nick, thanks for holding. Uh, you're on the air. Thank you for taking my call. My my quick question is, why on earth would the Obama and Biden administration negotiate and give Paris so much? And why? What I what is their experience? Excuse, then why, what do you guys think the real reason is? Rick, I'll, I'll punt this over to you. What do you think the real reason is? Yeah. You know, it's a great question, but um, I, I think I've said this a number of times. The opposite of America first is consensus with the Europeans. Joe Biden has placed a priority on having consensus with Europeans. And what that means is, is that you take the European position and you take the American position and you somehow meet in the middle. And and I don't think that that's a smart diplomatic move. Both sides don't get what they want. Uh, some people would argue compromise is good in, in this situation. I would argue that it's the lowest common denominator of what we both agree, and it's actually terrible all the way around. So the, the long answer is, is that Joe Biden cares more about keeping – all of Europe together, Europe applauding the posi- the uh, policy position, and he not he isn't necessarily looking at what's best for the American people or the or Europeans or people around the world. Final question here: When we see Iran uh, going in one direction, and we know that Biden is still going to pursue the diplomatic way to try to resolve this, um, in a sense. When you started under the uh, Trump administration with others, the Abraham Accords, which brought Israel closer to the Gulf states than they ever had been before. Do you think if the Biden administration continues down the wrong path in dealing with this, it will only encourage Israel to continue to foster those relationships with the Gulf states and even Saudi Arabia to confront the threat of Iran? I do, and I, I think not only is it going to empower the Israelis to continue trying to find common ground with some of the Arab states, but I think it also compels the Arab states. You know, what what we have to uh, remember is that Iran is wildly unpopular, and no one knows uh, the the bad behavior and the lies of the Iranian regime more than those who live in the neighborhood, the neighbors of Iran. And so I think that it's very, very clear that they're pushing the Iranians uh, out and we're trying to uh, get the Israelis and the Arab uh, states to find a, a way forward with peace. All right, Rick. Well, thank you so much for joining us again live from Israel. We have a great time. Jealous. Wish I was there. Thanks again for everyone. For listening to the show today, watching it on social media platforms, make sure you follow us everywhere you could possibly imagine. We are there. The ACLJ is there with brand new, incredible content. And obviously, our legal fight continues on all of this. You can support the work of the ACLJ during this matching challenge at ACLJ.org. That's right. Every donation that's made. So say you give $5. That's great. Because there's someone on the other end saying, hey, I'm going to match that $5. And so on and so on and so on. So every little bit helps. That's at ACLJ.org. Donate there, but also take a look at all the incredible content. Download the ACLJ app. Follow all of us on social media. We'll see you tomorrow.